a little schedule of events. We're gonna start with some presentations by our lovely speakers, then go into a little panel, a short audience Q&A, and then there will be a book signing over there. So please do purchase the book in the store. Tonight, we'll be learning about natural disasters and their impacts on the people and nature of this region. And when we consider both the natural history of this place and the contemporary impact on the, of these dramatic events, it's really important to acknowledge that here at Mohai, we're on the historic and contemporary lands and waters of the Suquamish, Duwamish, Muckleshoot, and all Coast Salish people. Historically, native communities were forcibly removed from this place, but today we honor their continued endurance with deep respect and gratitude for their unbroken stewardship of this place. And it's really important to learn more about the people whose lands you're on, so we encourage you to please visit their websites and learn more. And with that, I will let our lovely partner at History Link, Kiko Hughes, introduce tonight's speakers. Thanks so much, and thanks again to Mohai for um, helping us host these events. Um, my name is Kiku Hughes. I'm a white passing mixed race woman with short brown hair. Um, and I'm very pleased to introduce our two guests who will be each doing a, a short presentation followed by a sort of discussion questions and Q and A. Um, so first we have Eric Wagner, a writer and biologist who lives in Seattle with his family. In addition to After the Blast, the ecological recovery of Mount St. Helens, he is the author of Penguins in the Desert and Once in Future River, Reclaiming the Duwamish. He has a PhD in biology from the University of Washington where he studied Magellanic penguins, sorry, I didn't practice that word. <laughs> Magellanic penguins in Argentina. Um, Sandy Doughton is an award-winning science writer for the Seattle Times and the author of Full Rip 9.0, The Next Big Earthquake in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I'm very excited to welcome Sandy first um, to talk about her book and uh, the geological uh, uproar of this region, I guess. <clears throat> well, th thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you for having me. Um, as a journalist, uh, History Link is just an uh, invaluable resource. I use it all the time, and I'm really, really grateful for it. So, and of course, I always love Mohai. It's a beautiful place. Um, so in keeping with the theme of natural disasters, I'd like to start with a question for you. If the ground started shaking right now, what would you do? Get outside? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, this is something I think about a lot, you know, when I'm in different situations, not in a kind of paranoid way, but just kind of try, trying to be ready in case it happens. Um, in a place like this, it's kind of tough because, you know, we're in a big open area. There's a drop ceiling above us. Probably the thing you have to worry about most is a light or a ceiling panel falling on your head. So we might all want to stampede over and get under that table. <laughs> uh, of course, that wouldn't do as much good if the building was going to collapse on us, right? And this is a very old building. This building was designed in 1937. It was finished in 1942. And that was long before there were any seismic building codes in this area. Uh, but we're really lucky because in 2000, when the city of Seattle took it over, acquired it from the Navy, they did significant seismic upgrades. So we can be pretty confident that the building won't collapse on us, which is good to know. Um, I, I found, a, just noodling around on this, I found an interesting analysis by the state emergency management office, and they, they estimated that those upgrades cost about $700,000, but yielded $14 million in benefits in terms of damage, injuries, and deaths avoided because of the upgrade. So that's a benefit cost ratio of 20 to one, which is pretty good. Unfortunately, we still have a lot of um, potentially dangerous old buildings in Seattle and the rest of the state that haven't been upgraded, and that's something I'll touch on a, a little bit later um, when I talk about <clears throat> how ill-prepared we are, I guess, in, in this region. But first, I'd like to just offer um, a short scientific detective story, 
and a little historic perspective uh, on our understanding of earthquake risks here in the Pacific Northwest. I'm sure everybody here oops, has heard of the Cascadia subduction zone by now. And I'm sure you all have kind of a vague idea that it's kind of nasty and that it could <laughs> you know, do some pretty bad things to us. In fact, it could be the worst natural disaster the US has ever experienced the next, the next time this thing goes. Uh, so it's kind of weird and disconcerting to realize that for a long time, the Northwest was considered a seismologically dull corner of the world. Um, it seems you know, ridiculous in hindsight because you really only have to look around you at our incredible landscape to realize that it had to have been shaped by powerful geologic forces. Um, that's something that the Native Americans who lived here for so long have always known. Many tribes passed down stories to the generations of times when the ground shook so hard that people were knocked off their feet and the water rushed in and left canoes tangled in the treetops. Um, but by the time white settlers started flocking here in the early 1800s, and now I'm reminded by the word white that I didn't describe myself, um, I'm an old white woman with gray hair and glasses. <laughs> so um, when settlers started flocking here in the 1800s, they didn't pay much attention to um, Native, Native American legends. If they thought about earthquakes at all, they thought they were um, you know, better off than those crazy Californians. And the city of Seattle Chamber of Commerce used to actually run ads in newspapers all over the country trying to lure businesses to come here. And they would quote this guy, Collier Cobb, an eminent professor of something, who said, Los Angeles may shimmy with earthquakes, San Francisco may get another one, but Seattle, set on the deepest glacial drift yet discovered, has a shock absorber that makes the city immune for all time. Great. <laughs> well, today we know that the Pacific Northwest can get a greater variety of earthquakes and more powerful earthquakes than California can ever get. We get these deep earthquakes like the 2001 Nisqually earthquake. I'm sure some of you remember that. We also have shallow faults running all over the place. There's one that runs right through Seattle. So those are more California style earthquakes. It really wasn't until the 1980s that people started to put together a fuller picture of our seismic risk here, including the possibility of these giant coastal megaquakes and, and tsunamis. Let's see, I can't remember, okay. And the reason people started thinking about it in the 1980s is that there were plans to build, I can't remember now, seven nuclear power plants here in the Pacific Northwest. Does anybody remember, whoops? Yeah, it was the Washington Public Power Supply System and it was gonna build seven of these things. Two of them were at this place called Satsop out near the coast. They were never finished, but you can see those towers when you drive from Olympia to, to the coast. And so the idea of building nuclear power plants near the coast uh, sparked a re-examination of the seismic risk. And so people started thinking about um, this 700 mile long feature off the coast that had been recently discovered back then. It's right here. Today we call it the Cascadia subduction zone. And this was um, fairly early in the uh, development of plate tectonics. And it took a while to figure out what was going on here, but they finally did figure out that what, what's happening is that the tectonic plate that makes up the seafloor, which is right here, is colliding with the tectonic plate that makes up the continent. And when two tectonic plates collide, something's gotta give. So what happens is that the seafloor dives or subducts under the continent. So subduction um, is the process that creates coastal mountain ranges and, and all of our volcanoes. Um, in, ter in terms of earthquakes, subduction zones wouldn't be a problem if the plates just slid smoothly past each other, but they don't. The oceanic plate is moving toward the, toward the continent and they get stuck and it keeps moving, the pressure builds until the plates snap past each other and that's an earthquake. The rule of thumb in seismology is the bigger the fault, the bigger the quake. And there are no bigger faults on the planet 
than subduction zones, and there are no more powerful quakes than those that come from subduction zones. The um, 2011 Japan quake and tsunami came from a subduction zone. The biggest uh, earthquake ever recorded occurred on a subduction zone off the coast of Chile in 1960 and measured magnitude 9.5. The Pacific Ring of Fire that we hear so much about is basically uh, just a ring of subduction zones. But, but, you know, the Cascadia subduction zones seemed different because settlers had been here for about 150 years and they had not heard a peep out of it. And so a lot of geologists, particularly those that were working as consultants for these nuclear power plant projects, um, you know, claimed that it had just run out of steam, that it wasn't dangerous anymore. Uh, so the US Geological Survey said, well, wait a minute, we need to take another, another look at it. And people started asking the question, you know, is this fault dangerous? Has it produced powerful earthquakes in the past? And as so often happens in science, the answer wound up coming from a completely unexpected direction, which was mud. So this is Brian Atwater. Any of you know Brian or met Brian? Yeah, he's a, when Brian joined the US Geological Survey in Seattle in the mid 1980s, he didn't really know that much about earthquakes. He had spent most of his career uh, digging around in the mud around San Francisco Bay, trying to figure out how land levels had changed over time. And in fact, he was so out of the earthquake loop that when the USGS had their first big meeting in Seattle, to discuss the Cascadia question, Brian asked if he could tend, attend, and the organizer said, well, no, you're a mud guy. What could you possibly have to, to contribute? Uh, but it turns out Brian was the one who found the answer to the question everybody was looking for, and he found it by digging in mud. And he started out at Nia Bay in this low-lying stream, and he would dig in the banks of this stream and other streams and find, it's, it's, the picture's a little bit, oops, the picture's a little bit dark, so it's kind of hard to see. But he would find these layers of soil that, he, that were buried under, you know, like three feet of mud, but he could tell they had been sitting at the surface at one point because there was vegetation still in them. So he could see that something had happened, boom, to cause that ground to drop three to six feet all at once. And as he looked up and down the coast, he found these layers everywhere. And in some places, he found as many as nine of them, one on top of the other. And he became convinced, and he was right, that these were the signatures of major subduction zone earthquakes in the past. And the real capper was when he also started finding thick layers of sand that could only have been washed in by tsunamis. And this is the, you know, that's a, that's a geologic detective story, but the, but the perhaps most amazing one is what still stands as one of the, you know, preeminent feats in the field of paleoseismology, the study of ancient earthquakes. And that's when scientists, including Brian, but a lot of others, were able to pin an exact date and time on the most recent of these Cascadia megaquakes. So radiocarbon analysis had already narrowed it down to sometime between 1600 and 1700. There were people living here, of course, and Native Americans were here, but they didn't leave any written records. But there was another group of people who might have borne witness to this event living across the Pacific Ocean in Japan, where they had been keeping records on earthquakes for more than a thousand years. And this is, a, this is a picture from that time, that time period, and it shows this uh, Japanese strongman or leader, and he's got a big rock on top of the giant catfish, and they thought that the earthquakes were caused by the movement of the giant catfish, so he's protecting his people from earthquakes. <laughs> so a, J a Japanese tsunami modeler named Kenji Sataki calculated that if the last big subduction zone quake along the Cascadia subduction zone had been a magnitude nine, which means it would have ripped the entire length of the fault, then the tsunami it created should have been powerful enough to cross the Pacific Ocean and hit Japan. 
So Kenji and other Japanese scientists started looking through these ancient scrolls. And sure enough, they found several reports from a winter's night in the year 1700, when villages along the coast of Japan in the middle of the night were mysteriously flooded. And people were trying to figure out what had happened because one headman wrote in these scrolls, it seemed like a tsunami, but there wasn't any earthquake. So that year, 1700, was confirmed here in Washington State at this place called the Ghost Forest of the Copalis, which is out on the Pacific Coast, where tree ring dating showed that this stand of cedar trees had been killed in the year 1700 when the ground dropped and their roots were flooded with, um, with salt water. So, um, see, I can't remember if I put that other, yeah. So, using, putting it all together, you know, using, using the modeling to estimate how long it would have taken the wave to cross the Pacific and hit Japan, and looking at the dates in these ancient scrolls, the researchers were able to kind of backtrack and determine that the last time the subduction zone ripped was January 26th, 1700, at 9 p.m. <laughs> I know, it's pretty amazing. So today, from multiple lines of evidence, we know that there have been about 20 of these full rip nine subduction zone quakes in the last 10,000 years. There's also evidence, not quite as solid, but um, for the same number of slightly smaller quakes, maybe magnitude eight or so, uh, that only rip the southern half of the fault. Which means, you know, if you do the math, <laughs> that this region could get hit with one of these coastal mega quakes, magnitude eight to nine, every 250 years or so, on average. And as of right now, it's been 323 years, three months, 21 days, and you know, 22 hours or so since the last one. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean we're overdue. That's not really a true concept, because this is a, this is a estimated timeline of those quakes, and you can see they're not regularly spaced. Some occurred 200 years apart, others were 1,000 years apart. But what it does mean is that the next one could happen, um, you know, while we're sitting here, or it could happen, you know, when your grandkids have, have grandkids. Um, and, and recall that those aren't the only quakes that we get here, these subduction zone quakes. This is a kind of a complicated diagram that just shows that, you know, we get quakes that originate deep underground, and we have these, sh these shallow faults as well. So we, we really hit the jackpot here when it comes to um, earthquakes. And unfortunately, we're not very prepared for them. Um, of, oh, this is just a, this just shows some of the, some of the crustal faults in, in this area. It seems like they discover a new one every year. So a few years ago, FEMA did a big um, exercise drill they called Cascadia rising. And the scenario that they used, which was admittedly a you know, worst case scenario, estimated that 10,000 people could be killed, there could be 30,000 injuries, a million people displaced, $80 billion of damage in Washington and Oregon alone, and it also impacting um, a really huge area. This shows a, kind of a map of the expected shaking, it would be strongest on the coast, not too strong, you know, here in the urban corridor. But the thing about these subduction zone quakes is that it shakes for so long. So the ground, you know, an average earthquake will shake for about 20 to 40 seconds. And if you've ever been one in one or you've talked to somebody who has, it feels like it, that goes on forever. But these subduction zone quakes could last like two to five minutes of ground shaking. So, you know, so, we're going to be in for a world of hurt here when that happens. Uh, we have a lot of uh, vulnerable infrastructure. Old brick buildings are some of the worst. We've known about these for 100 years. The city of Seattle has been dragging its feet for since the 1970s on uh, requirements that these buildings be retrofit. I've heard that they're talking about maybe doing something soon, but we'll see. We'll see. 
another type of dangerous old building or old concrete buildings like this one. You know, this one's been retrofit, so we're not worried, but this was one in Christchurch, New Zealand. These are the kind of buildings that pancake on people. And in the recent Turkey quake, these were the ones that caused so much death and destruction. Remember a few years ago when a truck clipped a bridge over the Skagit River and the whole thing collapsed and had to be rebuilt? Well, you know, there's going to be thousands of bridges like that after one of these quakes. And that's just a map showing where some of them might be. And then our infrastructure is also very vulnerable, our water systems, our power systems. This is a picture from Christchurch. I think it was like six months after the quake where um, there was a lot of damage to their water system and people are still que queuing up for water there. Let's see, then there's the tsunami, which, you know, this, our coast is not nearly as developed as Japan's where this picture had taken, but that's gonna be pretty nasty on the outer coast. It's not gonna be a big issue for us here in Puget Sound, but um, it'll be bad enough out there. And then I'm just gonna skip over this because <laughs> You know, you start seeing these numbers and these worst case scenarios and, and this is what it makes you feel like, right? It's like, oh my God, there's no, it's so horrible. There's nothing we can do. We might as well just give up. But that's not really true. There is a lot we can do. And, um, you know, we're actually starting to do some of it here in the Pacific Northwest. So I have to say I'm a little more optimistic now than I have been in quite a while. We have a really good resilience plan that was developed several years ago. Unfortunately, it's not getting political traction because, oops, I guess I cut that one out. Okay, it's not getting much political traction because earthquakes are not a, a high political priority here because we just haven't really had many of them. Um, and politi for politicians, you know, they've got more pressing things in front of them. So this is something that's easy, easy to put off. So the progress that has been made is really thanks to people in agencies and, and individual communities who are, who are doing what they have. For example, the Washington Department of Transportation has retrofitted about 400 bridges in the state. There's still a lot more to go, but they've made it a part of their regular schedule. So this is something that they're doing on a regular basis. This was when they were uh, working on the Aurora Bridge. I got to go down there and see some of the work they're doing. In C C City of Seattle has upgraded most of its fire stations and schools thanks to voter approved levies. In Grays Harbor County, um, which is not a very rich community, um, people voted to tax themselves to replace this old gym at Acosta Elementary, which is about, you know, less than a quarter of a mile from the coast, with a new gym that, is the, that was the country's very first tsunami evacuation structure. And so the building, the gym building was designed to be strong enough to withstand the earthquake, strong enough to stand through the tsunami, and tall enough with room on the roof for hundreds of people to take, to take refuge. Oh, okay, this, is, um, this was, this was um, part of a package of stories we did at the Seattle Times a while back, just kind of pointing out how um, you know, uninspired our local, our state leadership has been, our legislature has been. Um, when it comes to, to seismic safety, but in 2021, they finally adopted the state's first school seismic safety program. And um, so that's great, but the legislature is already whittling away at the money uh, appropriated for it. So the first biennium, they got 100 million, they asked for another 100 million this year, and they got 40 million. So we still have, oops. So we still have schools in this state like this one in Aberdeen where kids you know, are mandated by law to go to school in a building that has a 90% chance of collapse in an earthquake. Okay, so I just wanted to leave you with this last image. What we're seeing here, it's a little complicated, um, but each one of these black dots is a GPS station. And the arrows show the direction 
in which that station moves and they're proportional to the distance that that station moves every year. Don't pay attention to what's going on down here because it's California messing things up. But, uh, <laughs> but just look here, you can see that we're being pushed, we're being shoved to the northeast at a, at a fairly constant rate and that's from the subduction zone. That's because the oceanic plate is advancing toward the continent, those plates are locked and they're pushing us to the northeast. Not by much, I mean, uh, you know, it, it's, it's out on the coast, it's maybe about an inch a year. But when you think about how many years it's been since the last earthquake, that adds up to almost 25 feet that our coast has been shoved. So that's the spring being loaded for the next subduction zone earthquake. There's nothing we can do to stop it, and there's still nothing we can do to predict when it's going to happen. But there's a lot that we can do collectively and individually so that when it does happen, we'll be able to bounce back. So thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Um, anybody want to take this outside maybe and not do it in the basement? Um, I'd be open to that. Uh, so I'm Eric. I'm a white uh, male, brown hair. I'm wearing glasses. Um, I'm kind of twitchy, so that's something to keep in mind. And I'm, if Sandy, let's see. Whoops, there we go. Um, if Sandy's goal was to kind of scare the bejesus out you, I'm here to tell you it's all going to be okay. Um, it's a different, I, so my, the book that I'm talking about is um, After the Blast, uh, The Ecological Recovery of Mount St. Helens. And so I have a sort of different relationship uh, with this uh, notion of natural disaster and disturbance and terror and horror and all that sort of thing. Um, in that the topic that you know, I'm looking at more the, the response, the afterward, what happens um, before and, or after. And so in that sense, it's interesting to sort of think of Mount St. Helens as a disaster um, because it's been 40 odd years. It's still in the regional memory. And so this, this is a image of Mount St. Helens before the eruption from actually, I think 1979 when it was the, a beautiful snow capped peak um, in Southwest Washington. And at the time, I mean, as, as mountains go, it actually wasn't terrifically interesting, most of, at least in the scientific sense, because most of the attention was being paid at Mount Rainier. And so Mount St. Helens was just a nice place to go. A lot of people went there to recreate. You can see all these, the boats on the lake. Um, you can, there were scout camps and lodges and vacation homes around it, and it was just, a, it was just beautiful, it was easy to climb. Um, and then, you know, 1980 rolls around and this happens, and this is uh, catching the eruption, this is a picture of the eruption uh, midway through. Um, so the way that the eruption happened on the morning of uh, May 18th was there was an earthquake um, at the mountain, but it was, it was localized. And it was, it was, but it was strong enough to completely loosen the north flank. So there was a huge landslide and then there was a massive lateral blast. And what this is a picture of is of the ash plume that rose from the exposed vent afterwards. And all of this ash and pumice rose about 15 miles in the sky in about 15 minutes. And so the main eruption lasted about nine hours. And so to think of it in terms of disaster, the way that the news of disaster sort of reaches people, um, it was interesting, you know, you talk about going through historic records. This was all, you know, 1980. This was pre-social media. This was pre-Insta News. So this is a picture that shows uh, some folks in eastern Washington watching that ash plume bear down on them because what happened, it, it traveled to the air at about 60 miles an hour or so, and it took about an hour to get to central Washington and it reached Spokane about three hours later. And so this was on a nice Sunday morning for most folks. They went outside, they looked to the west and they see this sort of apocalyptic cloud approaching them. And that was how most people learned that the mountain had erupted. And so to, you know, in the, I'm still, I'm still thinking of, of Sandy's talking, I'm like, oh God, the earthquake's gonna happen right now. <laughs> um, but the, you know, in the lead in as when, 
so Mount St. Helens started sort of jostling and moving in March. Um, and so there were a lot of little earthquakes and a lot of small eruptions and steam eruptions and things like that. And they were, they were really interesting. They were, I mean, in the, in the sense of what happened later, they were kind of cute. Um, and so there was a lot of, there was a lot of sort of jostling of how, how much care should we take around the mountain? How, you know, should people be allowed on it? Should they be, you know, should they, should they flee? And government scientists were like, you'll probably be okay. You know, the events will be sure to be localized. And so imagine waking up in Eastern Washington and looking up and seeing this bearing down on you and thinking, oh my God, you know, the world is ending. Um, and so this is what Mount St. Helens looked afterwards. This is a, this is a, a shot taken from a plane um, in the days after when people were busy looking for survivors, um, for the missing. The, the eruption ended up killing 57 people and, and this was what was left, this totally, you know, the seemingly desolate land. And it was, it was spiritually shocking um, to, you know, to see it, to, to, you know, sort of compare this image with the one that had come before of this, you know, the beautiful mountain and the, and the, and, and the, and the forests around it. And it's also interesting to think of it in terms because when you're writing about something that is, you know, when you're treating something as history, then it can make it seem like whatever was found from that history is sort of inevitable, that the conclusions that people reached are the obvious ones. What else are they going to find? And so I like to look at this picture and imagine trying to approach it as a scientist, as a biologist or an ecologist, and thinking, you know, looking at this in a lands as a, as a landscape that you have to make sense of and having no idea how to do that. Because, you know, ecologists had been excited at the prospect of an eruption. It would give them a chance to answer some questions that, that you don't get to ask very often. But then to see it afterwards when things had gone completely differently than everybody had expected was, you know, it was jarring. It was, it was spiritually rattling. And so, but the other thing that's interesting, so in the way that Mount St. Helens is a, a familiar story and seems like this kind of big regional disaster, this, what this is, this is a graph that shows, it's taken from, a, from an article about what are called large infrequent disturbances. And so a, a, a volcanic eruption is a large disturbance and it's infrequent. And so you can see there are a lot that are shown here. There's the, there's big, uh, the 1938 hurricane, the Yellowstone fires, and all of them happen on these different scales. So you can see Mount St. Helens here on the, on the, the, the Y axis, if you will, is the, is the area affected and on the bottom is the, time, is the time after the disturbance begins. And so you can see that Mount St. Helens didn't affect a huge area and it didn't, the eruption didn't last very long. And so also in, um, you know, to sort of piggyback off Sandy's, you know, the, the, the Pacific Northwest is a, is a lively and jumping place. You can see that it's, you know, the, the volcanoes that we have are very busy and Mount St. Helens is the busiest, but it's not alone. And so it's, it was sort of taking that, that notion of, of a natural disaster, a natural catastrophe, and then, then thinking, you know, this is how, you know, this is how it has worked. This is how it has worked in the past. And then, but what happened this time? And so in that same sense of a, of a sort of limited disturbance, this is a composite image from a satellite showing the, the land that was affected by the eruption. And so the, the interesting thing about Mount St. Helens as an eruption was that before it erupted, most people thought of volcanoes erupting up. Um, you know, you ask a kindergartner to draw a picture of a volcano erupting, they'll draw the nice little cone and they'll draw some smoke coming up out of it. And so in that sense, when you think of the way that of, of lands that are affected, it's, it's pretty equal around the mountain, but Mount St. Helens had erupted out. And so because of that, the land that it affected was much, it was sort of this, particular quadrant. And what you were, you know, in that sense of, you know, the aesthetics of disaster, the Mount St. Helens definitely provided them. I mean, this is a picture from what's called the blowdown zone. And there are all these trees that were just completely knocked, knocked flat, as they say, the sort of proverbial matchsticks. And then this is a, this is a image from what's called the pumice plain, which is this area in front of the mountain that was baked under scorching hot pumice afterwards. So as part of the eruption in the, in the afternoon, these pyroclastic flows started, which was pumice kind of boiling out of the exposed crater and burying the land in front of the mountain under 120 feet, I think, of, of scorching hot pumice. It was like 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit and glowed red for just days afterwards. 
And this is what it looks like now. And so this is a, this is a picture of that sort of relatively same vantage taken from a place called Windy Pass. And you can see all of the purple. Um, these are all prairie lupins that grew, you know, that came back and came back much more quickly than anybody expected. The prairie lupin as a species was not a, not a mountain, was not thought to be an alpine species until it showed up at Mount St. Helens and did very, very well for itself and helped facilitate other plants. And so it was looking at the relationship between from that to this that was most interesting for me in that way of, you know, looking at, thinking of how, you know, the, the, the sense of what people expected and what they found was very different. And that wasn't just with plants, it was with everything. I mean, this is a picture of a carabid beetle, a little black beetle on the pumice plain. This was one of the first uh, creatures to return. It was found, you know, within, um, within months of the, of the eruption. And the beetles on the pumice plain are sort of famous in Mount St. Helens lore because they established a community there without there being any plants, um, which nobody, everybody thought the way that an ecological community assembles itself is first you get plants and then you get animals, but the beetles showed that you could also just get animals. And the way that they, the way that they recolonized this area was by making do with other beetles that had tried to establish there and failed. And so you kind of run through this series, the you know, sort of roster of Mount St. Helens is full of these characters of animals that were doing things that, that they weren't really supposed to do, showing these kind of hidden capacities that nobody thought they had. This is a picture of a pocket gopher, which if anybody has a garden, you know, maybe you know pocket gophers, maybe you hate pocket gophers. But at Mount St. Helens, we love pocket gophers because they were, one of the, they were another sort of facilitant of recolonization. Um, where the pocket gophers were, plants soon followed. They had managed to survive the eruption by being in their, in their tunnels um, at, under the snow. And so they were one of the first, uh, another animal that was, you know, that when people saw it, saw evidence of it immediately afterwards, it was sort of caused them to rethink the, what the effects of a disturbance could do. This is a picture of a western toad. Um, the western toad is one of my favorite stories from Mount St. Helens because it's threatened throughout the western states. Um, and at Mount St. Helens, it, was never, it wasn't too common before the eruption, but there were little pockets of them around different lakes. And then after the eruption, the, what the eruption did was it created this habitat that toads love. Toads don't like trees, so Mount St. the eruption got rid of all the trees. Toads don't like snakes because snakes eat toads. Uh, the eruption got rid of all the snakes. Toad, to toads don't really like birds because birds will eat toads sometimes. And the eruption got rid of all the birds in a way because they didn't really have anything else to do there. And so the toad populations at Mount St. Helens just exploded. Um, you can go there now to this place called Mita Lake um, if you're there at the right time of year and you'll just see a disgusting number of toadlets <laughs> crawling around your feet. And it's really, I mean, it's nauseating, but it's also beautiful, um, but it's mostly nauseating. <laughs> This, oh, this is, oh, I was like, did I keep that slide in? It turns out I did. Um, so this is a, a picture of, I haven't counted them, thousands of toadlets. Um, all those things that look like dirt are tiny toads. And what happens is they, the toads lay eggs in the lake and then the eggs hatch. The toadlets come ashore so they can disperse throughout the land. And if you're lucky enough to be there when they're emerging, it's, you know, you stand up, you have to stand on a log so you don't step on them because you feel like you'll be, you know, in the supposed battle between me, the human, and all of the toadlets, I'd actually, I'd put my money on the toadlets. And this is, so this is a picture of elk, a, a bachelor herd of elk um, on the pumice plain. And this is another one of those, you know, with the, that shows the way that you can expect things to recover and the recovery up, you know, after disasters can sort of modulate over time where the elk had initially been sort of a good thing at the mountain. They broke up the ash to make room for plants. Um, they ranged far and wide and helped plants disperse. But it, lately, they're, they're becoming more complicated. They eat trees, and the trees is sort of the last thing to arrive, and that makes people upset, and so they're trying to figure out how to manage it. And, you know, but within that is the, these sort of, within the elk, the elk as, a, as, a, as an entity sort of contains all by itself these you know, the complications, the complexities of the, the, the idealism kind of at Mount St. Helens where 
you know, th this has been a space where people have said, we're going to let nature kind of take its course. That's, you know, there's the monument there and we will, you know, we will let, you know, ecological succession continue substantially unimpeded. But in doing so, you know, they ended up drawing this line in the land and saying on this side it will do this and on this side there will be something else and never the twain shall meet. But the elk make it meet. The elk stitch those bits of land together and that, you know, has caused some, some psychological difficulties for managers who are expecting uh, particular outcomes, shall we say. And then these are, this is, uh, you know, in the same sense of, you know, I spent most of my time just now talking about the land, but the lakes themselves hold all of these surprising tales as well. These are some rainbow trout um, that are the <laughs> lucky recipients of a survey that were gill netted and, and now they're, you know, they're dispatched and being measured. Um, but they themselves are, you know, the, the story of the rainbow trout at Mount St. Helens, um, they had been, the lakes had been stocked before the eruption. The eruption cleared the lakes out because the, you know, the, the spirit lake especially became anoxic. And then somehow the trout came back. There's some mysteries of its origins, uh, perhaps human, perhaps non-human, who really knows. And they, but in their presence, you know, in the same way of the elk, they sort of complicate the narrative at Mount St. Helens of natural spaces where we let these things happen without having an effect ourselves. And then this is I, the, the one of the things that I've really enjoyed or I really enjoyed about the book was seeing uh, Mount St. Helens at all these sort of different times of year. So these are some bear tracks from earlier this winter. Um, when I was out there and just sort of wandering around and suddenly you see bears, uh, or I didn't actually see a bear then, I've seen bears before there. It can be energizing. Um, but it's these, these sort of last sort of components of assembly where, you know, where folks expected, where ecologists expected these things to take years are now sort of winding down and so all of that sort of feeds into the, into the story of Mount St. Helens, the, the, uh, the you know, the recovery, although we have to be careful about saying the word recovery, um, but that just that, that sense of in, that in disaster are these sort of other stories beyond, you know, that, that happened after the disaster itself. And so what I, one of the things that I would, it'd be interesting to see with Mount St. Helens, so the, these series of photos, Mount St. Helens is really a place of anniversary. I mean, you know, I'm talking to you now on May 17th because May 18th is a Thursday, um, but if, you know, if we could, we'd be here on May 18th and that would be the 43rd anniversary of the 1980 eruption. And so this, there's this kind of decadal markers. This was a picture taken April, 1980. June 1980, you see the difference. But then as we talk, we still sort of think in terms of that moment. And so this, this, this is a, these, those last three photos were showing the, you know, the changes in the land in very sort of regular markers of time. And, but, you know, in, the, in that sense of incorporation of thinking back to that original, of, um, that graph I showed of all the times that Mount St. Helens has erupted and so how each eruption isn't necessarily, you know, isn't defining of the place in that same way. It would be neat to sort of start to think again of Mount St. Helens at these different periods of time. This is a picture from 1936, an old picture, an old surveyor when Mount St. Helens was just one of, you know, the Fuji of the Northwest as they called it because of its, its lovely peak. And then sort of separating it from that you know, the, the fixation on the mountain itself and just sort of letting it live in its own rhythms and, you know, its own sort of, sort of different set of aesthetic. So that's my piece. Thanks very much. I'm not sure what that is. <laughs>
Awesome. Thanks. Can you can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much um, for your presentations. Um, I'm going to do a short couple of questions on my end, and then I'm going to take audience questions. Um, so, so one of the reasons that I wanted to have Sandy and Eric together in a discussion is because you're both in the business of communicating these really complex scientific topics to a broad audience, um, and a broad audience that has a lot invested in these topics. You know, these are, you know, times life and death sort of <laughs> topics. So, not to worry anybody too much again. Um, <laughs> But I, I, you know, I wanted to sort of pick apart your philosophy about how you communicate these topics and what is important to, um, to focus on. And um, I guess the first question that I have is, is, how do you develop these relationships with these scientists? You know, how do you uh, get into the community of scientists and, and how do you sort of internally translate what they're saying into a more mass uh, understandable uh, language? Yeah, Eric, do you want to go first? <laughs> okay, I guess I'll go first. Um, so, so how do I get in with a community of scientists? Um, so in the case of Mount St. Helens, it was, <laughs> it was suggested to me by an editor. And so there was, turned out to be this event. Uh, there was an event in 2015. So this, there, at Mount St. Helens, is quite a community of scientists. There, there are scads and scads of people studying all sorts of stuff. And this is very intentional. Um, at the, at, in the lead into the eruption, there was a forest ecologist at Oregon State University um, who gathered together all of his buddies who were also ecologists of different types. And he said, hey, there's this mountain in southwest Washington that's going to erupt. We should we'd study it afterwards. Hey, what do you say? And so they they were all raring to go. Um, and then, so they spent a very intense first few years after the eruption. And then, you know, people would kind of peel off and go do other stuff. And uh, there'd be, you know, careers develop in different ways. But they would keep coming back every five years and they would call it a pulse. And so in 2015 was the last pulse. And so I went and, um, and there were 120 people there, you know, big, famous folks, their graduate students, postdocs, less famous people, and one writer. And the, you know, we were all going around and introducing ourselves and saying why we were there. And I was like, I'm Eric, I'm here to write a book about Mount St. Helens. And you just feel this chill descend. Um, I, was, I was an interloper, I was not to be trusted. And um, so really, in, for me, it's, a, it's always kind of a trust exercise because there, you know, it's kind of showing that you are willing to do the work of understanding it. Um, and it was a lot of work. Uh, it's always a lot of work. And the other thing that sometimes happens is, so I have a, I have a PhD in ecology. And so the, the, the flip side of trust exercise is that sometimes when I approach a scientist to talk about them and they're like, oh, you have a PhD, you'll totally know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so they start hitting me with all of their big terminologies and and I say oh yes I you know of course I understand what you're saying but for a moment just to be you know because we're friends pretend I'm an idiot and explain <laughs> it to me in fairly simple language and then then this will happen two or three times and then we can stop pretending so it's it's a lot of I mean for me it's it's just sticking with it you know like getting in the getting in there and kind of refusing to leave and then um asking them to explain things to me in simple language. Yeah, the, what I tell them is explain it to me like you would explain it to a third grader. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that really helps, I think. <laughs> well, I've been, I've been covering science as a journalist for a very long time. So I have, I have a lot of experience dealing with scientists, and you know I absolutely love them. And I find that if you're interested in what they're interested in, you're interested in what they're doing, they are so willing to explain it to you. And they're very, for the most part, you know, they're dicks, of course, but, uh, but they're, you know, they're generous with their time. And most of them are funded by public money, so they also have an incentive to, to communicate to, to the public what they're doing. And so as a journalist, you know, you're, you're kind of a conduit for that. And specifically on the, on the earthquakes, I, um, I started reporting in the Northwest in um, 1990, I think. So I was actually here for a lot of these major discoveries. You know, when I said that it had 
only been since kind of like the mid 1980s that people began to put this picture together. So I was there for a lot of these things as they happened and got to know a lot of the scientists, the geologists at that point. So when I came back to do a book, it's like, you know, I already had sort of a baseline of understanding, but it, it's, as Eric said, it's hard. It takes, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort. And with Brian Atwater in, in particular, I mean, I just shadowed him for several months. Anytime he was going anywhere, doing anything, he'd give me a call and I would, I would come and, t and tag along because you want, you know, what, what, one good way to convey science to the general public is to convey it as a human enterprise. And to do that, you know, you show the people who are doing it. And so you get to know them as human beings and try to, you know, convey their personalities. And, you know, Brian is just a gem of a person, so couldn't have been a better one to feature. Yeah, that sort of brings us nicely into the next question, which, um, you know, it's, it's about, you know, the most effective ways that you believe to communicate these complicated scientific topics. And um, especially, you know, recently we've, we've been dealing with the uh, issue of communicating complex and often heated emotionally, uh, or emotionally invested people in the scientific topics with the pandemic. And, and we've seen sort of the ways that um, the human face of these scientific topics can sometimes be uh, less effective in, in, in conveying the truth of, of what you're trying to convey. Um, so, so do you have any uh, sort of philosophies about how you humanize these scientists, how you bring these stories to a personal level, and, and what has worked best in your experience? Sandy, maybe you can start off. Mm. Until the pandemic, you know, I, I would have said something different, I think. I mean, you know, like I had... Um, I had always found before that it was most effective, <clears throat> you know, if you could tell a story. And, you know, science is naturally there's a there's a story of discovery there, you know. So how did you get interested in this? You know, what what drew you to it? And, you know, how did you feel when you made make that discovery? That was a that was a good way to convey a lot of these things. And and I think it still is. I mean the the, the pandemic just just really, I would say, shook me to my core because I got detailed for two years to cover that and it was the worst experience of my career. Even though the, you know, the science was interesting, um, I was really caught up in it, but every story I wrote, I was just attacked nonstop, mercilessly in, in vile, personal ways that I had never experienced before. And it was, it was nothing to do with science. It was to do with values and politics. And, you know, I don't know what the answer is to that. I feel really kind of hopeless, uh, you know, when, when you're up against such entrenched differences in, in perspective. So that, um, you know, the idea that Anthony Fauci is, is a villain to so many people in this country is still just astounding to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> so, I didn't write about the pandemic very purposefully. Um, so, when it comes to humanizing science or what do you show, I like to really show the process of it. Um, I think the way a lot of people are introduced to science is through textbooks, and so a textbook can make it seem like it's a straight shot from one discovery to the next, um, a few sentences, and you've leaped forward 70 years. And so I like to show how often scientists are totally lost, um, how they, you know, how they change their minds, how their debates in the field. Um, I thought it was interesting how, you know, there's a sense of, especially, I guess, to return a little bit to the pandemic, um, there was this real urgency of we want an answer and we want it now. And that was something that science couldn't provide. And as a scientist, I was fine with that. You know, I know how it works. Um, for people who are, you know, for whom this is a very traumatic introduction to the inner workings of trying to figure out how a virus works or how you're going to prepare a vaccine for it. and there's the great open future and you have no idea what's going to happen, that's quite terrifying. And so then you end up with these sorts of outcomes where you're attacking the messenger. Um, 
And so I, I mean, in general, I think the more that you can, speaking for myself, the more that you can show how, you know, usually modest a lot of the advances are that, that you know, as people are working forward in small steps um, and constantly refining and that there's a lot of sort of, sis the, sis the way that this, the present system is in place is to, to, you know, always work with kind of truth as a provisional uh, construct. You know, it's not like truth with a capital T, but truth with a tiny little provisional T. Um, <laughs> Until that, you know, until you find out that you're wrong, and then it's rewritten, and then you know the textbooks get changed, and you get the fifth edition, and you have to buy the new one for eighty dollars. <laughs> um, so that's 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 kind of, you know, and I I, I, f I feel like that, you know, that's all I can do is just show show this kind of messy middle of it um, of this one particular type that I happen to know. To say nothing of all of the vastness that is human knowledge, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so one thing that I sort of a bonus question that I didn't uh, that I thought of as you were speaking is the idea of scientists that have come from different disciplines sort of converging and how that can enrich their discoveries. Um, I'm wondering sort of if you have seen that cooperation a lot and, and if you feel that you know the way that science like the system is set up at, at currently if that encourages that kind of cross discipline uh, collaboration or not. No, I'll go. I'll yeah. take my tennis turn. <laughs> um, absolutely. I think uh, I actually, I mean, I think there are a lot of, there's a lot of incentive t for cross-disciplinary work. I think there's, there are a lot of people doing it. I think the, the results are very interesting. It's, I mean, there's always a little bit of sort of, you know, jargon-ishness <laughs> that can make it a little difficult, but, uh, you know, if, I think I, I generally think it's wonderful. I mean, I, again, Mount St. Helens is a great example of that, where there are all these different folks from different disciplines um, sort of feeding into this same place and geologists seeing how ecologists work, ecologists understanding how geologists work, them kind of making fun of each other. Um, and, <laughs> you know, th this morning I, had a, I was having a conversation with a geneticist um, and, you know, about a seabird and she was totally changing the way that I thought about this seabird. And I don't know, maybe I was totally misunderstanding her, but it was pretty exciting. And so, no, I, I, I'm, I think that in, you know, in cross, I, especially because, I mean, it's, you know, with that kind of cross fertilization that a lot of really interesting things tend to happen in all respects, you know, whether plants or science or anything else. Yeah, I, I think, um, <laughs> Seattle is an incredible center of interdisciplinary research in all kinds of fields. And just a few blocks from here is the, the Allen Institute for Brain Science, which I think, you know, kind of epitomizes it in, a, you know, a, a wonderful way because you have, you have people who, you know, are computer experts who deal in huge, you know, massive data sets. So they're studying, you know, individual neurons individual nerve pulses and you know they they build these you know they have people who can build these incredible machines where you have like one little neuron in the middle and all of these devices that that measure it and then you have physiologists and you know brain scientists as well and you know they're putting that all together to you know really um build a more detailed understanding of how the brain works, I think, than anybody has, uh, has ever done before. So there's a lot of that going on here. Uh, and how about um, scientists working with the humanities? Do you see that there's a lot of collaboration between sort of the scientific disciplines and the humanities, you know, both writing, as, as you are doing, but also, you know, other, other forms of interpreting your science? There's a lot more of that going on in um, disaster management, <coughs> which, is, which is kind of interesting. Um, you know, how people respond in a disaster, how, you know, can communities become more resilient and what does that take? You know, how communities can build connections before something happens. So, you know, there's a lot of work that shows, shows that, you know, communities where people are connected to each other 
um, are more resilient and they recover better. And so there's a lot more social science work going on there being integrated with the, you know, the geology and the, you know, the emergency management kind of people. And also, <coughs> you know, understanding that different populations are going to have different needs in a disaster. So if, you know, if you're a person in a wheelchair living in a tsunami zone, then, you know, is that tsunami evacuation structure going to help you or not? And, you know, so what, what sort of systems can be developed there? So I've, I've seen a lot more of that recently. Oh, okay. Um, so science and humanities, yes, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of that. Um, I think, I mean, for me, one of the most interesting things is a lot of science, like data visualization, um, which takes a lot from visual arts. Um, and I, I could look at that stuff all day. I mean, just, uh, you know, the way that people are representing, um, you know, the way people are turning data into sort of beautiful work um, is, is cool. One more question, and then we're going to take questions from the audience. And this one is a little bit uh, uh, off topic, I guess, <laughs> or I, less important but still present element in both of your books, I think, is the idea of sort of the way that capitalism has influenced the scientific discovery. You know, we talked about the, the, the motivations of certain of geologists employed by the, what do you call it, whoops? Yeah, the, the <coughs> yeah. Uh, sort of, you know, the, the incentive uh, of capitalism to sort of dictate how how scientific findings are interpreted, um, and uh, you know, in, in Mount St. Helens there was the issue of warehousers sort of having their logging crews out and is it safe? And yes, it is. Does it really? Um, and and so I wonder if you have any thoughts on sort of the state of the scientific community in regards to capital and, and how much influence it still has in the conclusions that we're reaching. Thoughts on science and capitalism? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I mean, yes. <laughs> so, I mean, you think of the basic funding models for science, um, you know, science, basically a lot of it, you know, even stuff that doesn't seem like it should, or that it would, you know, it still sort of feeds on the scraps from capitalism's high table. Um, I used to write a lot about whales. I love writing about whales. And then, you know, you find out that a lot of marine mammal research is funded by the Navy, um, which is the projection of capitalist power. Um, the, you, you know, a lot of the work I do now is funded privately, you know, so that is a capitalist offshoot. Um, and then, I mean, so that isn't to say that, you know, these that it influences it, but it, it does, I mean, obviously it influences it. You know, we live in the system, the system, you know, we, we are sort of operating within its dictates. Um, but there are, there are times where it's interesting where, you know, I think of the, all of the findings that are coming out now about the effects of tires on salmon, um, you know, and, and, and basically tires are, are in the Pacific Northwest, all of that work that's been coming out. Um, and so the solution seems to be to build a better tire um, that, you know, obviously is going to take forever to work its way through various supply chains and, and regulatory models and this, that. But it, it's like you don't, you know, you don't think maybe we should drive less. You don't challenge, like, car culture in the West. Um, so, you know, it's almost... Uh, I forget what it is. Uh, there's some analogy of something that only hops as high as it, its perceived ceiling, even if there isn't something there. Um, toads in a bucket. Toads in a bucket, yeah. <laughs> Goldfish in a bowl. Um, so, yes, I, I think I, there, I, there's, there's, yeah, I have some thoughts. <laughs> okay, we'll take it off mic. Yeah. <laughs> I have fewer thoughts about this, but... Um, but it's, you know, what one worrying trend is that more and more science is funded by, by industry, by private interests. And I, I did an, a look at the UW at one point. I, ca I can't remember the numbers now, but it's like almost a third of the research funding now is coming from private entities. 
Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they're, um, you know, that the outcome is going to be what they want it to be. Um, but, <laughs> you know, it's... Then they just suppress it. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's that's another aspect. So if it's if it's what they hope it is, then they publish it. If it was negative evidence, then they don't publish it. So that so that's a that's a big problem, as well. But you know, to me, the wonderful thing about science is eventually the truth will out, <laughs> and you know, so those um, geologists from Whoops were saying, "Hey, nothing to worry about here. Cascadia subduction zone is dead," and then the USGS, a federally funded agency with no dog, you know, in that hunt, stepped in and took a, an unbiased look at it and said, no, you're wrong. So, I mean, eventually the truth comes out, but the consequences until it does can be severe, mm -hmm. troubling. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, do we have a mic that we can pass around or? <laughs> yeah. Please not yell because we are recording this. And so for the quality of our recording and for those who might need to be able to hear us amplified and for our craft fair, please use the microphone. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> so I guess like uh, my question would just be about St. Helens and specifically kind of like management going forward. Mm -hmm. Where do you foresee like the line kind of being drawn in the future of like where the succession is going to go. Because, you know, it's like the decision, we can kind of sit here and be like, oh, it's not a decision to allow the elk there, but obviously it is. You know, they could go and hunt all of them or they could decide to introduce wolves or whatever it is. But, you know, also just thinking about things like invasive species that I'm sure are beginning their own colonization efforts all over the place. So, like, do you foresee a future where they just kind of keep going real hands off, just see whatever happens, or do you think there's eventually gonna be some sort of guided or managed like succession towards a specific goal? <clears throat> um, so that's a great, I actually, uh, I like that you brought up wolves. Um, I used to have the, with the elk, of old, my old wolf, wolf talking point was that the nearest pack was in the Tianaways um, up above I-90, and so we're waiting for wolves to get there and do their, do their thing with the elk. <laughs> Um, but WDFW just announced, I think a few weeks ago, that a pack has established on the on the slopes of Mount Adams, and so wolves are a lot closer now. Um, it could be within you know five or ten years, and then they'll just they'll be have run of the place, um, or at least have a lot of elk that <laughs> they can they can dine out on. As for succession, I mean, there's there are interesting things. There's no sort of plan to change the the management strategy. There are occasional sort of flare-ups. There's one now um, where this is this is a long involved tale, but it involves Spirit Lake. And there's a so Spirit Lake in the eruption, uh, the eruption cut Spirit Lake off from its natural outlet. And so fairly early on in the early 80s they realized that you know, it's a, you know, a lake that's enclosed will just rise and rise and rise and then it'll break breach its dam and cause more downstream devastation. And these were communities that had just gotten hammered uh, by the eruption itself. And I, I don't really, I it's interesting, or interesting, it's a thing, where in the book I'm mostly dealing with ecology and I don't talk a lot about the, the, the economic effects of the eruption, but they were really substantial um, down the Tootle and the Cowlitz and in the Columbia. And so there are, so in response to knowing that Spirit Lake was closed and rising, uh, the Corps of Engineers drilled a tunnel through a hillside to let it drain, and so that tunnel is expensive uh, to maintain. It's It's been busted at times. It's in an active fault, or uh, <laughs> in a shear zone, and so it you know it, they spend millions of dollars every year maintaining it, and they're getting kind of tired of it, and so they want to be able to replace it, and that entails driving or building a road across the, the blast area. Um, the ecologists are aghast, you know. The whole mandate of the blast area is that there are no roads. I mean, there was a road once, but it's totally gone. And so to see um, the Forest Service, the U.S. Forest Service, which is the agency responsible for managing the monument, you know, pushing for this road has been rather upsetting to a large contingent. And so while there are no, so in that sense, the, the answer or the, you know, 
the developing answer to your question is there are no sort of directed management efforts at organisms within the monument. I mean, they're pretty content to just let whatever happens happens more or less. Um, no large scale interventions, but there are a lot of these other sort of humanistic pressures, um, whether to build a road, whether to let people come in and do, you know, engage in more recreational activities, whether to try to complete that road across uh, the pumice plain to link up these other two roads. And once you get into this kind of inside baseball stuff of you know roads and this and that and everything else, you you know it loses a lot of the Mount St. Helens mystique. You know <laughs> Mount St. Helens is this beautiful. Why are you arguing about these little two lane highways? And but that's kind of what happens is that you know as as the years go by, you know the 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 sort of value landscape changes, mm -hmm. and because a lot of the scientists who are working there are old and some are dead, and you know people are coming in with new ideas about what the space should be used for. Are there any other questions? questions? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, that was so interesting. Um, my brain is just like spinning. But one of the things I'm wondering is, I was really struck by how historical stories, and you can put in with that traditional knowledge, become scientific evidence when you think about the earthquakes, that we, that's the way we understand the science is by looking at the history and the traditional knowledge. Do you find that very often? Like, I, I was struck too, Eric, with your 1936 photo. I was trying to think of like, what does that tell us in a science perspective by looking at a historical photo? And does it become part of the scientific evidence in some way? Do you see that a lot in these stories that you do? Because I, I definitely tend to fall into like you have the human story and you have the science story, even though I know they're <coughs> intertwined, but it, it was just really struck by both of your stories about that. I think one of the neat things, so in ecology, we talk a lot about traditional ecological knowledge. Um, and there's a lot, there are a lot of interesting sort of partnerships happening where, um, you know, one that comes to mind is people working with herring, and uh, there's a, there was some really interesting work that was done just a couple of years ago uh, about, the, you know, being able to build in, you know, TEK, we, all, we even have lingo, um, TEK about like how herring behave that int, into these dispersal models, and so that, that hadn't been in there prior. Um, I think one of the neat things about, so, but to Go is I like that there's there's no term that I know of for traditional geological knowledge, um, but there should be, <laughs> and that's what really you know plays out a lot at Mount St. Helens. You know there are a lot of of, if, of histories of you know people talking about the mountain erupting in the past. Um, you know most of its its names from you know the Yakima and the Cowlitz have to do with it being. And a, a busy mountain, an active mountain, an active volcano more so than, you know, and, and so, you know, Mount St. Helens is upset a lot, or, you know, Lewitt and, and you know, Smoky Ma and things like that. Um, and so, I mean, as for what, you know, that particular photo provides, it's always, I, th I think it's always, I mean, Mount St. Helens before the eruption, again, you were talking about Weyerhaeuser, it was an actively managed and forest managed space that was dotted with clear cuts. There's this fun story of um, President Jimmy Carter flying out immediately after the eruption, uh, looking down by helicopter, marveling at the wastes, you know, oh my God, the devastation, and being told by the Forest Service guy who was with him that, oh, we haven't reached the mountain yet, those are clear cuts. <laughs> um, so seeing in a way that, it's almost, you know, how is it data? It's data because it's memory, you know, and it's sort of in that, you know, in, again, in ecology, we talk a lot about shifting baselines and what your notion of normal is and then seeing how that can change profoundly in rather short times. There's, um, his, historical images are, are playing a real central role in rethinking of forest management in this region because there, you know, you look at old pictures of some of these um, forests and you see how they were, um, you know, it was a varied landscape, there were openings, there was a mix of trees, there were trees of different ages, there were patches that had burned. And um, I, I just did a story where I was talking to some Forest Service people about this and they're using that as kind of a template for what they would like to recreate with, with active management now. 
to, you know, with the idea of reducing these catastrophic fires. That would be great. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions from the audience? Oh, one right there. So I just wanted to understand from you, like, um, I mean, as as a journalist or uh, I'm sorry, can you speak a little louder? Sorry, um, yeah. I just wanted to understand, like, uh, as a journalist or as a uh, biologist, uh, how do you uh, deal with your inner conflicts about, you know, uh, how to, uh, which, which portion to write about, uh, rather to write it about as a whole, um, in, in Seattle or, or in the subduction zone, or particularly about one topic. Uh, I mean, uh, focusing on, on one area. Uh, how uh, how uh, your inner conflicts, uh, how do you resolve the, those <laughs> inner conflicts, sorry? Well, if, if I had my way, I would write stories about animals all the time, <laughs> because I just find them fascinating. and you know, like ecological issues and stuff. I, um, I did love writing about um, earthquakes because I, I would, you know, as, as a journalist, you try to um, write about things that are interesting, but also important to people. And so for me, seismology was a great um, subject that combined both of those because you know, the science was fast, is fascinating, the people were great, and it's, you know, I feel like it's of great importance to the region. So that was something um, I hammered quite a bit, you know, trying to embarrass the state into <laughs> doing something, you know, by showing, you know, how far we are behind Oregon and California and British Columbia on, particularly on the schools issue. Um, I have a different job now, so I don't write about that so much. I, I write features for our Sunday uh, magazine, and my rule of thumb now is like, if I'm interested in it, <laughs> then I'll write about it. <laughs> I try to I try to to focus on things that that are important to people, but um, I guess maybe I'm a little more into entertainment at at this point. Oh, um, <laughs> I guess <laughs> it's funny to. I only focus on things that are interesting to me. <laughs> um, this is sometimes problematic with <laughs> my editors. Um, I guess, I mean, I like, I mean, for me, I like place-based things. I like to see a thing that you can look at all the threads that run through it. Um, and then I like something that you can, a concept that you can kind of take and turn over in your hands. Um, as for those, the conflict of you know, how do you, I resolve them? I have yet to. I mean, it's <laughs> always, you know, you, you're done and you're always dissatisfied and you move on to the next yeah, and try to fix what you did and you make new problems, so. <laughs> and in my previous job at, you know, at, this, at the Seattle Times where I was, you know, like a daily reporter, um, you know, oftentimes I would be working on something that I thought was important and then my editor would have some stupid idea <laughs> or I thought it was a stupid idea. And, you know, sometimes I could argue him out of those, and sometimes I had to write them. Never, you know, never, you know, never really bad stories, just things that I wasn't interested in and I didn't think were that important, but he did. <laughs> this is a capital and science and right. humanity is all sort of merging yet again. <laughs> all right, I think that might be time. Um, so yeah, thank you again so much for your wonderful talk. <laughs> and I guess, sorry, one more thing. Um, if you want to shout out what, what you're working on now. Well, I'm always working on a new story. And I was, I was telling these guys earlier that one that I'm working on now is about the Ballard Locks. And it's a, one of our photographers on staff was interested in doing kind of a photo essay about the locks. And so we've been spending a lot of time down there, and today we were down there talking to the lock master, <laughs> which has to be the greatest job title ever. <laughs> <laughs> but I still don't know what the story's going to be about. So if any of you have any ideas, let me know. <laughs> um, I'm working on a book about rhinoceros auklets, <laughs> which are these small gray birds that are you've probably never seen, and they're strange and wonderful, and I love it. 
<laughs> but they're in Washington. They right? are in Washington. Yeah, so <laughs> keep an eye out. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you again so much. Thank you. <laughs> We're gonna do a little signing of After the Blast over here in the back table. Um, but before you go, if you would like to help us do the best in history programming, it would be wonderful if you could take our survey. It will enter you to win a raffle, which is exciting. <laughs> so thank you, and thank you to our partners at History Link. And please join us next month for our Pride History Cafe on Wednesday, June 21st, that mysterious slide, which is a decade of gender justice with the founders of the Gender Justice League, Danny Eschini and Elaine Wiley. So join us then. <laughs> <laughs>